awesome. Magical. These movie special effects are part of a whole revolution in sight and sound entertainment. Today's advancements in technology are propelling filmmakers, musicians, visual and sound artists of all kinds into new realms of expression and expanding the very nature of entertainment itself. But how did it all begin? The motion picture was one of the earliest forms of entertainment technology. In the beginning, audiences were awed and amazed simply to watch motion recreated from real life. Incredible as it seems today, this film of the Lyon Express arriving at the station caused some patrons to shriek, duck under their seats, and even to faint. But as the novelty of watching scenes from everyday reality began to wear off, Early movie makers turned to new subjects. Some began to reproduce skits and comedies in the tradition of burlesque theater. Others began experimenting with the camera to create some of the first movie magic. By stopping the camera and restarting it after the scene had been changed, these pioneers were able to create a series of crazy transformations that amazed audiences everywhere. In this scene, the photographer was carefully replaced by a dummy, creating a spectacle which must have shocked the unsuspecting audiences of the day. Early filmmakers also used the device of double exposure, rewinding the film in the camera to photograph a new image onto the original scene. These early camera tricks laid the foundation for what was to become the art of special effects. People have always hungered for the marvelous, the wonderful, the amazing. Before the invention of movies, it was the magician who catered to this universal desire. So it was no accident that the filmmaker known as the father of movie special effects was a French magician, Georges Méliès. Méliès is most famous for his surrealistic film, A Trip to the Moon. Completed in 1902, it was the first science fiction movie ever made. Méliès, seen here as the first man on the moon, combined elaborate theatrical effects with animation and special optical tricks. He produced some 4,000 films in all, and in the process discovered many techniques that are still in use today. Méliès' inventive spirit inspired filmmakers around the world, triggering a quest for ways to create better and more realistic special effects. This quest was to lead, some three decades later, to the creation of King Kong, one of the most famous and beloved of all the creatures ever brought to life by special effects. Kong certainly illustrates the textbook definition of a special effect, a technique or device used to produce an illusion of reality in a situation where it is not possible, economic, or safe to use the real thing. When King Kong first appeared on the screen in 1933, many viewers believed he was a real, living creature. To achieve this astonishing realism, the makers of King Kong perfected and combined many different techniques. Here, Kong is a model about 18 inches high, and the captured heroine is nothing more than a tiny doll. Much of the forest and the cave in these miniature sets is depicted by matte paintings, realistic scenes often painted on glass to provide both the foreground and background of a set. In this scene, a previously photographed image of the actress is projected from the rear onto a portion of the miniature set. It's like a horrible dream. The same technique is used here to integrate a film of the miniature Kong model into the window area of a life-sized set. Live action, miniature sets, and matte paintings, combined with large-scale mechanical props like this giant hand, all work together in King Kong to create a compelling sense of reality. In Kong, the existing special effects techniques 
were really refined to a great degree. What turns me on is that we are creating something that doesn't exist and that can't be done, we'll say, in any other way except through special effects. Matte paintings, miniatures, and also particularly the rear projection in miniatures. And that is a projection machine that projects a pre-photographed film and it is integrated into a set, a miniature set in many cases. And uh, uh, there were things that were developed, such as the screen for the rear projection uh, was oscillated so that it would smooth out texture of the screen. I enjoyed my experience on it because I learned a lot. And I uh, look on that picture today, as, as many do, that it still is entertaining to the newer generations that have come since. It's a little surprising to realize that the most exciting space fantasies of today still use the special effects methods of King Kong. In this memorable scene from The Empire Strikes Back, the Imperial Walkers are models about a foot high. Like King Kong, they are painstakingly animated, frame by frame. All right, coming in. At New World Pictures in Los Angeles, filmmakers today use the same method to bring models to life. This technique is called stop-frame animation. The models have joints which allow them to be moved into different positions. Once placed in the set, the model is carefully manipulated into just the right stance. The camera is lined up to photograph the scene, with the model temporarily frozen in one position. A single frame of film is exposed. Leaving the camera in precisely the same position, the model is then moved again a fraction of an inch, and another single frame is photographed. This process is repeated hundreds of times. If the movements are made carefully, the model in the finished film will seem to move as if it were alive. Alarm. The same kind of skill and ingenuity no. that goes That's into animating miniature models is also required for the construction of full-sized sets used in live-action scenes. In the movie Android, a variety of inventive that. techniques were needed to create the illusion of life in a futuristic space station. Serve power for our experiments. We're on the sets from Android, and this is the main corridor from the film. This is basically just a lightweight wooden structure with the look hung off of it, or the illusion. In this case, it's made out of foam core, which is an eighth inch of styrene with a high gloss finish on it and aluminum siding. In the corridor, we were dealing mostly with long shots with the camera, and we weren't too concerned about close-ups, so we saved most of our detail work for other places. This is Bay Observation, and here's an example of where we did some of our detail. This is a security locker, and this is just an aluminum box we've made and glued on some buttons, put some colored paper behind it, and backlit it to give the impression as if this was actually a working unit. It went coupled along with this, which is, once again, aluminum with just light bulbs in it. When it was hooked up to the sequencer, it would sequence around, and the alarm going off would give the feeling as if the actors were in a force field when they were over in this section. But since we were in space and we had to deal with outer space in some way, the script called for there to be uh, the use of a window. And we could deal with this in a couple different ways. First off, we could use rear screen projection, which is a special material that you stretch as a screen and then project from behind it. Or you can go with blue screen, which is just blue material 
that we can mat anything into that blue that we would like to be out in outer space. In this case, though, with the window being so huge, we didn't want to have to deal with all the time what's out there because of slowing down production and such. So we used a, a thin styrene, which would bounce a reflection of the room every time you looked at the window, except for when we wanted to get up there and see what was outside. Basically, all these sets were made out of uh, fairly inexpensive materials and a lot of found stuff to, to try to create the illusion that we wanted. One of the things we wanted to do was try to give the feeling as if it wasn't on the ground, as if it was in space and it wasn't on some solid planet or something. And something that worked beautiful for this was milk crates, which we just picked up and sawed down and threw in here and, and definitely gave the feeling as if there was another level or something else below here. Turn out to meet me in the greenhouse. In addition to realistic sets and miniatures, sometimes the script calls for creating imaginary creatures that can be made to move without any camera tricks. Some people call it special makeup effects. Some people call it prosthetics. I don't know what to call it. It's creating an organic structure that moves. This little guy is a good example of what cable control can do. These are all bicycle cables. They're attached to a uh, fiberglass armature, a skeletal structure inside. There are little affixed mechanisms to the foam rubber casting, and it moves when articulated with cables. I am asked to create a living, breathing entity, uh, something that looks organic, but is articulated in a way left up to my own discretion. And lately that's been cable control, puppets, muppets, masks, just about anything you can think of. Uh, for example, in the film Android, I was asked to create uh, a facsimile of Klaus Kinski's head. But the code specifically states... Don't tell me about the code. To create the mechanical Klaus Kinski head, first we had to start with a direct casting of Klaus Kinski's face. That is, alginate over his face to create a, a solid dental stone version of him. Based on this, we create a silicone mold. We press clay into the mold, create a Kinski sculpture. Based on that sculpture, we create this mold. From here, we create a core. From the core, we create a fiberglass skull. It's cut, hinged, and mechanized. By mechanized, I mean we put cables everywhere muscles would go. We put the mold together, we create a foam rubber casting which is about a uh, half inch to a quarter of an inch thick all around. We put it all together and you have a living, breathing Klaus Kinski head. A little bit worse for wear but he has a few movements left in him. Looks a little upset. Max 404. He has a little plate in the back of his head. When they remove his hair and his little panel opens up. There's little flashing lights in there where his assassin circuit is. I'm just asked to create things that don't normally exist, but somehow have to for a film. Another very important element of producing successful special effects is the art of creating believable miniature models. A lot of ingenuity went into the building of the model spaceships and space station for the film Android. Our assignment was to create a space station and a police ship which would be part of a fleet of police cruisers that were out in this sector of outer space. So our model builder worked with the director and came up with some designs that we knew that we could do a good job on within the parameters of the rather strict budget. So basically, our, one of our main techniques of model building is to take a basic structure. The basic structure in this case is a watch display case. And then use model kits that you can buy in the store to add detail 
We might use pieces from battleship models or gun models, such as a rifle barrel might look good as part of the engine of a spaceship, or a, a piece from a battleship might look good as a storage tank for a space station. And it's just using shapes and using objects in a creative way and using your imagination. Once the miniatures are built, they still must be photographed in movement and combined with the rest of the special effects elements. Let's take a look now at how these models were integrated into this spectacular space scene, created by Midland Production Corporation at their state-of-the-art studio in Richmond, California. Once again, the spaceship is a model constructed of hundreds of parts from various model kits as well as specially formed pieces. The movement of the model and the motion picture camera are guided and tracked along 12 independent axes by a computer. Each of up to 20 elements of a complex scene has to be filmed separately. One of the basic principles of special effects is that images can be combined to move together even though they were filmed separately. The first step is to film the spaceship against a black background. This camera movement is memorized by the computer, making it possible to repeat this exact shot as many times as necessary. This time, the movement is repeated in a darkened set with flaring lights, simulating the powerful blast of the rocket engines. These flares will appear in the exact location of the engines photographed in the first shot. To combine this shot with a background image, it's also necessary to film the ship in silhouette. This will produce a strip of film that will allow light to pass through the scene everywhere except for the precise location of the spaceship. Once again, the process is repeated, this time greatly overexposing the rocket ship to create a negative image. The set equipment, still visible, will be blocked out later. After the spaceship has been filmed, the computer motion control unit is reprogrammed to film a new shot. This time, the camera is filming the background of the scene, a large model of a planet's surface. As before, the film camera is tracked through a series of complicated, predetermined moves that can be duplicated as many times as necessary. The camera here is shooting from the audience's point of view as the rocket heads toward its explosive collision with the space colony base established in one of the craters of the planet. Finally, each of these separate film elements is loaded into the optical printer where it is combined to create the finished effect. It begins with a light source and two projectors in which we put previously exposed pieces of film, a camera, and all controlled by a computer. In a shot like 47, where the ship crashes into the base, we would put in this projector a piece of film of the base and a mat of the ship in order to not print the base where there would be shipped in the final composite. That would be printed onto this roll of film. The film backed up to frame zero. These taken out, the ship put in, and carefully lined up with its mat, and then printed into that hole that was left in that space in the film. And the final result is a composite and a piece of film that will later be integrated into a finished film. Optical printing, combined with modern computerized motion control cameras, have made possible an incredible precision in special effects photography. In today's movie adventures, special effects artists sometimes combine dozens of separate elements to produce the desired effect. The job of putting together all these images requires patient and painstaking work. 
but the results are often amazing to behold. Quick, jam their conlink, center switch! Much of the incredible movement and energy of these scenes was made possible by a remarkable device called a Steadicam. This is the Steadicam. Its carefully balanced system of pulleys, springs, and joints insulate the camera from the movement of the camera operator. This unique design allows the camera person to obtain a smooth flowing, continuous shot over virtually any type of terrain. Imagine your task is to follow these children at play as they run up the stairs of this park. This is what an ordinary handheld shot would look like. The jerky motion, inevitable even in the hands of the most expert operator, draws attention to the camera. On the steady cam, however, this spring-loaded arm acts as a shock absorber. The perfectly balanced camera mount maintains its stability while the operator monitors the scene on a small video screen. With some 45 pounds of equipment strapped to his torso, this cameraman is having no easy time moving smoothly up the steps. Let's take a look at the shot, however, and see just how forgiving the Steadicam can be. To create a sense of speed, a scene can be photographed in fast motion, simply by slowing down the rate at which the film advances in the camera. The illusion is one of flying along at high speed. In Return of the Jedi, these beautifully controlled background shots were filmed by Garrett Brown, the inventor of the Steadicam. the right stuff, special effects artists were called upon to capture the gripping immediacy of real events in the history of aviation. The special effects for the right stuff uh, required a kind of uh, documentary look that could easily intercut with live action airplanes and that I think was the most difficult thing that we had to pull off believably for the audience. Phil Kaufman, our director, wanted the audience to feel uh, the raw energy and speed that is was sort of at the heart of uh, of uh, flight testing, and, and uh, he felt that if if there wasn't that sense of violence and energy in in those sequences where men were trying to break the sound barrier, that the audience uh, wouldn't really know what they were up against. To try to get a handle on on what would ring true. We studied a lot of Air Force research footage, test footage that uh, we got a hold of from Bell, Bell Aircraft or from uh, NASA and the government to try to, we'd look at the footage over and over, analyze what it was that the documentary cameraman in those cases or the research camera that might be locked to the fuselage of an airplane, what that stuff looked like. And then we tried to duplicate those same uh, documentary camera techniques in effects work. There's necessarily a period of exploration, and sometimes that process leads us through lots of crazy kinds of experiments. Simultaneous to um, investigating motion control techniques, we tried about every other thing that we had come up with, including the use of helium balloons to uh, carry uh, small models aloft, and following that with long lenses documentary style. We tethered planes from bungee cords so that they would bounce. We tried using rockets in untethered planes, just blasting them straight up and trying to follow the little rocket plane. The investigation of all these techniques really started to come together when we tried uh, some of the same approaches outside, outdoors, in natural sunlight. Okay, let's go! I took an F-104 model to our third floor window, asked Rick Fichter, our, uh, one of our cameramen, to run outside and tell me how it looked. 
just thrown out the window like a frisbee. He uh, uh, stood on the ground, and we had some guys with a parachute uh, strung out like a like a safety net to try to catch the plane. And uh, uh, he allowed us how it was terrific. And when we showed the footage to Phil Kaufman, the director in Dailies, the next day, he he uh, felt the same way and uh, uh, felt that it played directly into that realistic uh, kind of gritty quirky quality that real events have as opposed to computer motion controlled events. We built uh, a number of models in multiple kinds of scales. You can see that this uh, model, which some people call Dumbo, we uh, have thrown this thing out of the window, tried to, about every way we could to destroy it, and it's still persisted in uh, surviving. We also uh, worked with a number of smaller um, sized uh, size models. We have this is a four-foot model. We had a, a, a two-foot as well as this six-inch model. It's this size that was used um, when the plane, when the uh, experimental plane is dropped from the mothership, the B-29. To create the background clouds, we used a World War II peachy boat camouflage fogger. Uh, we tethered airplanes on wires from um, horizontal points on the ground sometimes and sometimes from an 80-foot man lift. We would just hold it at the top of the, uh, of the wire and let it drop down through the clouds. To create the illusion that the plane, uh, the X-1, was approaching this sonic barrier and was uh, experiencing that uh, buffeting that General Yeager described, we applied a vibrator to the front lens element of the 1200 millimeter lens, making it look like the plane was about to fall apart. What we wanted to put across in the re-entry of John Glenn's capsule was the, the sheer violence of that event with flames and uh, chunks of this retro pack breaking off and falling away. We achieved the re-entry effects by two different means, one of them being the use of liquid nitrogen. The liquid nitrogen would, would spew out from around the rim of the capsule and out of several nozzles within the retro pack, and that would be blown backwards away from the direction of travel of the capsule um, to create the sense of this uh, in a violent airstream. And then that white uh, uh, liquid nitrogen was, was backlit with uh, orange gels, that is, um, orange filters over all the light sources so as to make everything that appeared to be white nitrogen now red nitrogen. In the X1A sequence, we had to create the illusion that the plane became uncorked at around Mach 2.5. That is, it went into an erratic spin from which Jaeger barely recovered. Um, the close-ups of that spin that would give the editors something to, that they could cut with was shot uh, almost exclusively indoors in the studio with the plane mounted on a um, spinning device that allowed us to, to rotate it around in front of a painting that was also spinning in the background with ni liquid nitrogen being pumped through the scene. Doing the special effects for the right stuff, we discovered that there's no such thing as a standard technique. We uh, felt that what counted was to try to serve the director's vision. And uh, we had to be willing to try any and everything, as ridiculous as some of those techniques were, to uh, achieve that. Um, we had to throw out a lot of preconceptions. And um, I suppose in this kind of work, the only limit is, is one's ingenuity and the budget. Special effects can be used to create a world that doesn't exist, but nevertheless seems to be real. In the film Blade Runner, artists produced a surprisingly convincing vision of Los Angeles in the 21st century. Starting with the script, uh, Ridley Scott, the director of Blade Runner, asked me to design the vehicle ideas for the film. We started off immediately with the spinner, the most difficult one to build. It became a classic industrial design exercise in sequence, starting with concept sketches for shape, refining those to 
uh, specific details for a vehicle, an actual vehicle, organizing the mechanical detail systems, which made it look like it actually flew. It was an internal lift idea called an aerodyne. The detailed sketches were then done after the concept was finalized in the form of gouache sketches. The interior idea, the overall vehicle design, and then the finished concept was handed over to the production designer, Larry Paul, and his staff, and the special effects people uh, who actually built the fixtures. Working as a concept designer for a film like Blade Runner was to invent a concise uh, alternate reality, which was the uh, director's vision uh, translated through uh, real sociological and technological uh, parameters that we developed by discussion. We very seriously took a sociological idea uh, coupled with technology and imagine that buildings would go up in height. Uh, current buildings are about 1,300 feet and we envision 3,000 foot buildings. That puts into play a whole series of, of construction ideas such as elevated roadways, huge access pyramids up to the towers that are the buildings themselves and for the particular reality that we were creating for Blade Runner we wanted a sort of moody uh, almost a oppressive technological uh, atmosphere. Science fiction films like Blade Runner provide plausible visions of the future based on sound sociological projections. These previews of possible future societies can both instruct and forewarn. Futurists like Sid Mead study the leading edge of today's technology and try to imagine where these technological breakthroughs will lead us in the future. We are riding on this little planet around the sun, uh, hurtling through space towards some unknown point and how we get there and in what kind of style and in what kind of uh, mental and spiritual and emotional state is purely dependent on ourselves. We have nobody else to depend on or to blame for that matter than our own averaged intelligence. great to look at. You may not be aware that it sounds terrific, too. Listen carefully for a minute. You are hearing a state-of-the-art movie soundtrack. Dense, richly textured, with a powerful effect on your emotion. Sound effects play a surprisingly large role in the experience of a movie. They add texture and reality to every scene. At Hollywood's Nyman Tiller Associates, matching footsteps is one of the many tricks in a repertoire of movie sound magic. On the Foley stage, natural sounds are created by an artist called a Foley walker. The Foley walker must have the skill and timing of a dancer as he matches sounds simultaneously to the picture. Sound effects like these are commonly added to a movie after it has been shot. This allows the mixer to isolate the separate sound elements and enhance their quality.
Building the sound design for a film is a complex endeavor. Some movies have nearly a hundred separate soundtracks. Today, electronics and computers assist in this process on many levels. At Nyman Tiller, one major innovation is the access system. Thousands of sound effects have been stored on a magnetic disc. This computerized system replaces the traditional method of sound editing, which requires rooms full of editors and stacks of magnetic soundtracks. Long hours have to be spent searching for and retrieving all the separate sound effects from various reels of tape. With the aid of a computer, however, the access operator is able to immediately retrieve the sound he wants from the magnetic disk. Matching the sound effects to the picture is a fascinating process of trial and error. The mixer will hunt about for a sound effect, natural or artificial, that seems to work best. Then he may alter that sound by changing the pitch or equalization. As in traditional sound works, the judgment and skill of the individual is still the crucial element. The good thing about this system is that you can manipulate the sound, you can change the pitch, you can make it run almost forever to infinity so that you have the opportunity to stretch sounds and make them fit the picture more than you can conventionally. For example, if you call a helicopter, now this is just the raw sound, of the actual length of the sound that runs. Now that actual sound runs three seconds and 25 frames, which is not very long. I can take the same sound and now I can make it run forever or loop it so that it'll just keep coming around again. So now the sound is running and it will just keep repeating and repeating, but it's a noiseless repeat. You don't hear it repeat or anything. So I can take it and slow the pitch down, speed it up, change the pitch. So what I can actually do is start it off at a very slow, just the, the blades turning. Then by increasing the pitch, I can make it take off. And then fly it away, take it away out of just disappearing off around the mountain or whatever. And then it can come back in. Hover for a second, slow down. And stop. So that's all from three seconds and 25 frames of sound. That's one of the advantages of this machine. But whether or not computers are used, the first step in any sound editing process is to collect a library of sound effects. Sound effects artist Frank Serafini regularly travels about the Los Angeles area collecting sounds for the feature films and television commercials he works on. Sometimes natural sounds recorded in the field like this will later be altered, slowed down or speeded up or even run backwards to create unusual effects. At other times, these natural sounds will be combined with each other or set to completely different visual images to create artificial effects that can seem more real than the authentic sound itself. Each of the many separate sound effects elements of a film will eventually be orchestrated into a whole effect score, just as precisely as any composer would arrange a musical score. The creating process starts with understanding how a sound relates with a particular visual effect and uh, understanding the characteristics and the amplitude of the sound. Um, in most cases, I take sound and create a natural organic effect and uh, then if it needs to be taken further or expanded, I'll add a synthesized sound effect or process it with uh, digital delays 
and uh, electronic signal processing equipment. Uh, there's several different things that can happen to a sound. The sound can be sampled into a digital synthesizer, which takes um, the sound and stores it into numbers, uh, computer information. And then you can mani manipulate the sound uh, whichever way you, you want to. You can loop it, uh, you can sustain the sound, you can turn it backwards. The emulator digital synthesizer is a keyboard that uh, that allows you to do these types of functions. You can take a voice, for instance. This is digital sound. This is digital sound. That is my voice stored in digital memory into this computer here. This is digital sound. Then I can take that sound and this is digital sound. This is digital sound, digital sound, digital sound, digital and sound, manipulate digital it anywhere. sound, digital this is digital sound. 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 That sound can be taken backwards. And this turn is back again. This is digital sound. This is digital sound. Digital sound. Digital sound. So this process of analog to digital conversion is a very powerful tool in creating special sound effects. For instance, on Tron, um, this became very handy in creating the disc throw sounds. Uh, we took monkey screams from the San Diego Zoo, and we processed them into a Fairlight digital synthesizer and also a bullwhip snap of uh, cutting through air. We took those two elements and we were able to actually perform the discs as they were being thrown. In creating the uh, cycle sound in the Suzuki commercial, uh, that was a challenge to, to make this motorcycle uh, feel as though it were riding in a world of grid lines and computer animation. What excites me the most about working with uh, the technology and sound is the ability to create sound effects and music that have never been heard before. The possibilities are just endless. It's fantastic. The sounds of the future have arrived. Today's consumer technologies are bringing these innovations in sound to almost everyone, almost everywhere. But these are just some of the visible signs of a revolutionary new phase in entertainment technology. The amazing power of the computer is expanding our concept of special effects and making possible a whole new form of visual entertainment. Let's take a look now behind the scenes at some of the computer technologies that are leading us toward the electronic special effects of the future. For millions of kids, video games provide an intense, involving experience, often more compelling than movies or TV. Colorful, action-packed games give the player a sense of power not possible from passive, traditional forms of entertainment. When designing a video game, hundreds of gameplay combinations must be programmed into the computer, along with all of the visual instructions that accompany them. The look and complexity of the game design is limited only by the amount of this information that can be stored in the computer's memory. The amount of memory we have today will be very insignificant compared to what will be available to us in five or ten years. And we will see the home video game become much more sophisticated, more detail, more color, more shading. And eventually it will get to the point where you will not be able to distinguish a video synthesized game image from one that's perfectly naturally photographed. 
the action in the games and the number of levels that the games will interact with your senses will expand. What I've always hoped and dreamed for is that the individual person in their home would eventually create their own television experience. Many futurists believe the key to the new technologies will be interactivity, the ability for the viewer or player to become involved in the action. One conceivable direction for interactive entertainment is suggested by this remarkable invention, the flight simulator. At Ames Research Lab in California, pilots test hypothetical aircraft in a simulated cockpit. The images viewed through the six windows of the cockpit respond immediately to the pilot's command, changing perspective and location as the craft is maneuvered. The pictures the pilot sees are generated in real time by a bank of high-speed computers. In order to reproduce movement which corresponds precisely to the directions of the pilot, the computers must be able to handle millions of instructions per second. As if playing in a giant video game, the pilot learns the consequences of his mistakes safely. As computing power gets cheaper and more available, this type of visual experience may someday become possible in the home. But even the images of this sophisticated flight simulator only hint at the real possibilities of computer-generated imagery. Today, computers have opened up a whole new field for men's visual imagination. TV commercials packed with computer graphics have become a new art form. A computer is a new tool to the artist. It allows you to see things in ways that have never been seen before. What artists come up with, what visions they have, I don't know. I know that we have a tool now that allows me as a designer to, to discover things that I did not know I was going to see, uh, that allows me to be surprised. One of the things in the process of finding where visions go is you don't always have like a clear vision of what it is, but it's the process that you're doing that leads you there. The process begins at a computer terminal with the entry of each outline to be animated. The computer will be instructed to think in terms of basic geometric shapes called primitives. Once the computer has been told what shapes are desired and how they look from various angles, the designer programs in the movements to be animated. To solidify a shape, the designer must literally imitate the effect of light hitting a three-dimensional object as it moves around within the scene. The necessary calculations are far too complex to be carried out in real time. In fact, each frame, a fraction of a second, may take the computer up to several hours to calculate. The millions of bits of information necessary to specify all the shapes and colors on a frame are transferred to tape or disk storage and then read onto film by a laser scanning device. Even with a very powerful computer, a week of calculations may produce less than a minute of finished film. The results, however, often create a fantastic, self-contained visual world. Many of the television commercials that are most successful today are ones that are like living in a real dream. You know, it does communicate to you subliminally. There will soon be a time that one won't be able to tell 
reality from a computer simulated picture. Computer simulation is a fantastic new tool that allows people to express themselves so clearly and so accurately, more accurately than we have before, and we can apply as much natural physical information to those pictures as we want. You know, we can apply the force of wind or, uh, you know, gravity or uh, heat to the pictures. You can, you know, apply natural physical phenomena to the simulation of those pictures. So it's just getting closer to making films that have a new reality. Special effects in the movies of the future will increasingly rely on the dazzling three-dimensional imagery of computer animation as electronic effects open the doors to new visual worlds. technology has developed to the point where anything that can be imagined can be filmed. For special effects artists, these new technologies are powerful tools that can bring our dreams to life. No one knows what dreams the future may hold. We can only guess that our unlimited imagination will take us on ever more incredible journeys. Thank you.